Welcome to On The Level, broadcasting from the Blue Ocean Network studios here in Beijing. My name is Fergus Thompson. My guest today is Dr. Christian Brechot. He heads up one of the world's foremost uh, medical research and teaching bodies. That's the Paris-based Institut Pasteur, or the Pasteur Institute. Uh, founded, of course, by Louis Pasteur, the scientist sometimes called the father of microbiology. This non-profit foundation has worked for the prevention and treatment of infectious diseases for over a century and a quarter. It employs about 2,500 people from 60 different nationalities, and it has overseas uh, research centers in 30 two countries. In October last year, Dr. Brachot was elected as Director General of the Institute for a four-year term. He has a distinguished career in both medical teaching and research, specializing in hepatitis B and C, and he is the recipient of multiple awards in his fields. Uh, Dr. Christian Brachot, welcome to On The Level. Thank you. Now, if I could start by asking you the future of the Institute Pasteur. You became the president of, of this institution at the end of last year. Mm. Uh, it was born in a time of, of much advancement uh, with Louis Pasteur. Mm. What do you see for the vision for the first decade of the 20th century, of the 21st century? The Institut Pasteur will, uh, will remain and must remain at the forefront of uh, modern science. It, but it has a very specific positioning because it combines both being a very modern research institute taking advantage of the real revolution we are experiencing regarding science, medicine and public health, but combining this with the legacy, with the history you have mentioned, the, of working on fighting against infectious disease. So Pasteur, it's about modern, modern institute, modern research combined to history. Uh, the, the spirit of Pasteur, and this is what Pasteur will remain in the future, is to develop a science without borders, worldwide, mm -hmm. and uh, also to combine very basic research, creating knowledge, mining research, but then using this research for prevention of infection disease, for treatment of infectious disease. And this is the future of our institute. Now, uh, you are here on a very short trip to China mm -hmm. and uh, you've been visiting your research centers uh, this time in, mm -hmm. in Shanghai. What particularly, what role does the Institute Pasteur play in, in China? And what are your Chinese colleagues, the people that you're meeting here, officials and scientists, what are they saying to you about what the institute can do here? Well, the creation of the Institute Pasteur in Shanghai has been uh, recent, about 10 years ago. Uh, we also have another one in Hong Kong. They are very active, uh, very important. Uh, they create a lot of very good science. And also they play a very important role for, for public health. So what do they tell me? That we need to reinforce the links between the Institut Pasteur in Paris mm -hmm. and the Institut Pasteur in China. Uh, that we need to reinforce what is the major strength of the Institut Pasteur uh, is being at, in Paris is in, at the core of a network of 32 uh, institutes throughout the world. Now these two institutes in China, they play a very important role uh, for, for example, for, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, they have been very actively involved uh, regarding the um, avian flu. Mm -hmm. In uh, Shanghai, they have excellent research activities on hepatitis, on tuberculosis. So they are again at the forefront of the fight against these infectious diseases, which are still a threat for a large country such as China. Previous to this, uh, in yeah. your past life, you were the uh, President Director General of INSERM. That's a national body in France, yeah. the National Health and Medical Research mm. Centre. You are now top, heading a, a private non-profit organisation. What are the differences between these two organisations and your position in them? INSERM is a very efficient uh, research organization also, but this is a national. It spreads all over France. It is less international. Mm -hmm. The major difference, there are several important differences, but the major one is that the Institut Pasteur, for me, is an international institute which is based in France. You see, this is a major difference. The second difference is obviously in the budget. Mm -hmm. uh, the Institute Pasteur is a private foundation. We receive about one third of our budget from the government. 
which is something, mm. but which also means that I have to look for two thirds of the budget outside. That, so, that is quite a budget, I presume. What sort of money do you need to, to run each year? We, 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 have, uh, we are about 290 million euros. 290 million euros. Mm. And uh, yes, the activities of fundraising, also all the partnerships with industry are very important. And China is an area where we can make a lot of progress in this respect. And again, this is where the Pasteur Institute in Shanghai and Hong Kong are, are very important. Well, uh, China is day by day becoming a richer and richer country. Mm. There are some very wealthy people and companies in China. Mm. Now, if you were speaking to the CEO of one of these companies like mm. uh, Alibaba, who have money to spend, mm. what would your argument be to them that they should donate or, or put some donations into the Institut du Pasteur? Because we, they need to invest. We need to invest, all of us, but especially uh, they need to do so, in health. You see, the health is, we, we have made a lot of progress. And China is an excellent example on how a global public health strategy can be very efficient. However, we are still far from having really accomplished everything. And uh, it's a, I would say it's a moral need uh, to support research, but it's also a very good investment for the future, for all the next generations. It's also an investment for companies, because it's interesting, before being at Pasteur and after INSERM, I have been for five years the vice president of Institut Merieux which is a holding company, very active in China also. Mm -hmm. You see that this is a, a, a market which is very much developing. In other words, they should donate to Pasteur because first, they support what is the future of the country, of China, which will be, be based on achieving a number of milestones regarding public health. Second, because of the specific nature of Pasteur. Pasteur, again, is not only about China. It's an institute which is working worldwide, where you have connection between China and developing countries, such as in Africa, other emerging countries. This is the only institute which can provide information on a given disease all over the world, mm -hmm. immediately. And uh, also they should support us because of the spirit of Pasteur. Because Pasteur has been somebody extraordinary and because Pasteur is still working exactly in the same spirit. Right. In China today, are, are people like that being trained here? Could we see the Louis Pasteur or the, or the Cox of the future being trained in, in, in research institutes like that of Shanghai? Yes, I do believe so. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have to encourage the entrepreneur vision of a scientist, the freedom, their capacity to invent. Uh, the story of Louis Pasteur has been an extraordinary one because he was a chemist and he discovered the microbes, but because he was open-minded. Mm -hmm. And yes, I do believe, uh, I'm very impressed by, by what has been achieved in China in the past 20 years. And uh, I do believe that uh, all these research institutes, yes, they can provide the next Louis Pasteur. Institut Pasteur in Shanghai, also in Hong Kong, they keep the spirit, which is very important. There uh, have been huge progress, as you say, mm. in China in the health sphere. There have also been problems. Uh, from 2003, probably most memorably, we had the SARS outbreak yeah, here. Yeah. Uh, following that, we have had avian flu. It's becoming almost an annual event now in winter for warnings about avian flu. Mm. There's been uh, foot, hand and mouth disease, swine fever. Why is it that these epidemics seem to at least be first reported in Asia and very often in China? Uh, and is this the case or is it just what we're reading in the news? Well, this is true, but it's also true that you have other areas of the world, unfortunately, where you have also at the same time problems. Maybe uh, the news in China speak a little bit less, but uh, for example, we are facing an epidemic of chikungunya, mm. 
uh, presently, which came from Asia, but not from China, uh, to the Caribbean area. Uh, you have dengue virus, which is a very severe. So I would not say that um, China is the only place where you have this constantly emerging disease. But it is true that in this very large country, uh, where you have a lot of things which are changing, also the interplay between rural and urban areas, a number of things regarding also agriculture, not only medicine, it is true that this is a place uh, where we do see a lot of events, mm -hmm. but not the only one. Now, you have been coming to China on and off for many years. Indeed, the, the Institut Pasteur was involved in, in isolating the SARS virus back in 2003, I believe, yeah. through your uh, Hong Kong research centre there. Uh, i just read you, this is a, a piece from Xinhua, the, the official news agency here in China, from just from last year. Uh, it says, if there is anything that SARS has taught China and its government, it's that one cannot be too careful or too honest when it comes to deadly pandemics. The last 10 years have taught the government a lot, but it is far from enough. Would you agree with that, that the, the, the government has learned a lot but still has some way to go in terms of responses to disease? I'm talking here about transparency rather than the systemic yes. uh, response. You always need to improve. And I believe that, yes, there is room for improvement. You see, it's about transparency. It's about how do you recognize the very early events. You see, it's always easier on a retrospective basis, you say, okay, I should have thought about this. It's about having an immediate analysis, very sharp, of an event without mixing political, economical, and scientific issues. There is an event, we have to interpret it. Again, I believe a lot of progress has been made. Uh, but it is true. But you see, this holds true in any countries, including in France and in other countries. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is always the mixing between economics and science when and it politics comes and, science. And, and then politics when it comes to decisions. Right. Uh, the, you specialize in, in the area of hepatitis mm. uh, B and C. Now, uh, hepatitis, China uh, accounts for around a third of hepatitis B cases yeah. worldwide. That's mm. a, around 100 million, I believe. Again, I have the question why, why China? with this particular illness? Why at the beginning nobody knows? Why? It's an honest answer. <laughs> <laughs> Why in Southeast Asia, especially China, uh -huh. as well as in Sub-Saharan Africa, these are the two main starting points, we don't know. But what we know is that for centuries, for so many years, transmission from mother to child, transmission from human to human has maintained the rate of uh, uh, hepatitis B uh, carriage very high. Now, what is very impressive, uh, mm -hmm. there are two points which are very impressive in China. First, now we have the results of the large-scale vaccination. And actually, you have a rate which is around 8 to 10 percent in those patients who were infected previously. But when you go to the young children, mm -hmm. the figures are extremely low. So China, in two generations, will have eradicated hepatitis. B. You're optimistic that it will yes, be eradicated. Absolutely. Right. Now Going the on problem, but the problem is that meanwhile we have a huge number of patients who have been infected mm -hmm. many years ago, and unfortunately some of them develop severe liver disease. And so this is why, on the one hand, vaccination has been very effective. On the other hand, liver cancer, liver cirrhosis are still an important problem to face in the next 15 years. And is the Institut Pasteur involved in, in research in hepatitis and, and liver cancer here in China through your, through your centers? Absolutely. Pasteur Institute in Shanghai in particular. And this is something we want to emphasize and always coordinating the different Institut Pasteur. Shanghai with Paris, with Hong Kong, with other institutes. Mm -hmm. uh, something that could be curious for somebody who visits a hospital here in, mm -hmm. in China, especially in the wintertime, is that they will come across a room full of people sitting in armchairs with intravenous drips going into their arms, most of them suffering from colds, coughs, 
influenza sometimes. Mm. But many of these drips are actually uh, antibiotics. China uses per person 10 times more than the United States. Why, is, uh, why are antibiotics used so widely here and sometimes so inefficiently, in fact, abused in many cases um, through the system and, and although mm. they are prescription, uh, can be bought on the street as well? This is a major, major problem worldwide, but especially as you tell in sure, China. Sure, as you say, resistance to, to these is, it's, is a worldwide uh, it's, problem. It's something incredible. I mean, there has been some... I, I was uh, participating in a meeting with other heads of international research organizations two days ago. This is a major threat for the whole world. As in China, there is over-prescription, mm -hmm. and even beyond the prescription, as you said, many people use uh, antibiotics. Uh, almost and, uh, as, as pain pills. Exactly. Now, in addition to this, and unfortunately, some of these pills, they do not contain anything. Well, that's another they, issue. They are fake, mm -hmm. which is a major problem. Mm -hmm. In addition to this, you have the agriculture-related questions. Because the Is way the use of antibiotics in agriculture. Yes, right. and so in for and for the treatment of uh, for veterinary medicine. For you, you see, so it's a major problem mm -hmm. to be solved at a global level. This mm -hmm. is something where you need to have a new perspective where you combine everything: health, human health, but also veterinary, also the different practices in agriculture. So it's uh, something which needs to be. Uh, addressed very significantly. In the Chinese hospitals, I know that there are a lot of progress again, and there is a strong pressure to reduce uh, this uh, over-prescription. Uh, well, discussing with your Chinese colleagues or yeah. counterparts here, what do they say is the problem? Why are these antibiotics being, being prescribed so heavily, and in many cases, uselessly? It's a matter of education. Right. You see, you have fever, you want to take something, mm -hmm. and then you take antibiotics. But this is nonsense. But that's the way it goes. But the doctors presumably should know not to prescribe antibiotics to somebody with a, a common cold. They should, and they should be taught to be strong and to resist to the pressure of the patient. We, we have faced exactly the same in France. Uh -huh. And this is an area where uh, uh, really uh, global, again, public health strategy can be very efficient. Over the past 15 years, there has been a reduction in France of antibiotics consumption, which has been very significant. And I trust that the same can be obtained in China. But beyond this, this is one of the major problems we will face, which is the resistance mm -hmm. now, because this is there. Whatever the evolution of the antibiotics consumption, Resistance to most of the antibiotics is there, has already spread throughout the world. Right. We need to find new antibiotics, and we are working on this. The Institut Pasteur is extremely active on this, and we will use all our Pasteur Institute in the network. And you were asking a few minutes ago, why should some people give money to Pasteur? <laughs> This is because this we... This is a very good reason. Yes, it's a very good reason. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Michael O'Leary, who is the WHO representative in China, actually said uh, these drugs, he's talking about antibiotics, mm. are being lost faster than they can be replaced by new ones, as, as you were mm. working on. Um, do you worry that diseases that people felt belong to the past, such as tuberculosis, uh, syphilis to a certain extent, mm. uh, uh, could recur? We've seen multi-resistant tuberculosis in parts of China. Is this something that worries you? Yes, very much, very much. Multi-resistant tuberculosis, another key issue. Very important in China, very also important in other parts of the world, but very important in China. Also, when you have an association between tuberculosis and HIV, this is, again, a significant threat. And uh, yes, the truth is that we do not have... Uh, real, uh, really new treatments. Mm -hmm. We do have some progress. We do have some progress. But it's insufficient. So, yes, resistance to syphilis, resistant to tuberculosis, resistant to antibiotics. Resistance is a key word for the future of modern medicine. How to find new ways 
to avoid this resistance to occur. Uh, turning to uh, uh, another disease, but, but not uh, bacteria, viral based in this way, HIV AIDS is something mm. that the uh, Institut Pasteur has also been working on, and sure. it's something that uh, uh, has affected many, many people mm. in China, simply yeah. because the number of the population is much sure, bigger. Sure. Um, how, how is that going here? And also, again, are you working in your centres here in China on uh, new retroviral drugs? Mm -hmm. The situation is that we have had, as you know, huge progress in the treatment mm. of HIV infections, huge. But the truth is again that we do not really get rid, unless a few exceptions, we do not really get rid of the virus. So yes, we are working on this. You need to combine not only new drugs, but also new vaccines. You see, you have the vaccines that we take usually are what we call preventive vaccines. Mm -hmm. You want to avoid getting yes. a disease. Uh, but you can also have the vaccine be used as therapies, therapeutic vaccines to stimulate our defense against the virus and finally to get rid of the virus. And this is something, yes, many of our groups are working on. And uh, we, for, for all these uh, actions, be tuberculosis, be resistant to antibiotics, uh, be HIV, uh, we establish many collaborations with research centers in China you see, the Institute Pasteur, and this is something I want to emphasize further, mm -hmm. is not a research institute where we work by, us, by ourselves. Right. The spirit of Pasteur is that we are there to work and to work with our colleagues and friends. And this is really what we mm -hmm. are doing. This year, the world, particularly Europe, is marking 100 years since the beginning of the, of the First World War. Yeah. In four years' time, we'll be marking 100 years since 1918 and the Spanish flu or the grippe, which killed more people than the, the fighting did itself. A, a massive pandemic at yeah. that stage. A hundred years later, what potential pandemic concerns you? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer because you have many candidates, I would say, unfortunately. But let's... you, you have... I'm, I'm not sure that we are, that there is a real threat presently of a pandemic. You, 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 we don't know, but I mean, we, we do not have presently those days, I would say, something which is emerging. Mm -hmm. We have a number of concerns, we have listed some of them, but not a real pandemic. But the difficulty comes uh, from the following example. Let's take the Ebola virus infection. Mm -hmm. This is a deadly viral infection. Which is, currently which is currently ongoing. Yes. It, was, it has been uh, discovered, this virus, in 1976, something like that. So it's a recent one. And it used to be very confined to some areas in Central Africa because the virus kills, unfortunately, very rapidly, mm -hmm. at least 60 to 70 percent of infected. So there is no real, real the capacity to have dissemination mm -hmm. with asymptomatic kills carriers. too quickly to transmit. A, a, exactly. And, uh, but now then, recently we had an epidemic in Guinea. And now we learn that it has transferred to Sierra Leone, which is another country close. So what I mean is that I'm not, I do not believe that this will be a pandemic. But it just testifies of the fact that we have worldwide a kind of reservoir of viruses, which we don't know. Mm -hmm. So the only key word is surveillance, monitoring, global effort, combining all the expertise worldwide. Uh, in China, the Institute Pasteur works with the Ministry of Health, with the CDC. We work with the Chinese Academy of Science, with the Chinese Academy of Medical Science. We partner. Mm -hmm. And then you can have something global which is efficient. Then, yes, I believe that we can prevent pandemics. Mm -hmm. So this is not a very precise answer because I don't know the answer. Well, <laughs> it, it is the sort of uh, the storyline from a Hollywood movie that some pandemic comes out of Africa or Asia and, yeah. and the rest of the world is, and some doctor like you is, is flying on a plane around the world. Yeah. Um, 
You first came to China in, in the early 1980s yeah. uh, as a young doctor or mm. with the Pasteur Institute, I understand. Yeah. Um, you were working there. What were your impressions at that time? What, what impressed you about China and, and your colleagues that you were working with? What, what memories do you have of that? Well, first, I have an extraordinary memory. It was in 1981. I spent three weeks in Shanghai uh, teaching molecular biology to students. My memory is about enthusiasm. Young people who were so enthusiastic, so keen to learn, so keen to also to with a really a spirit of uh, having science at the service of mankind. And that was exactly the spirit that we had at the Institut Pasteur. And many of them actually, uh, they have been trained and they became very prominent scientists and with very good positions, so it's a success. You must then, be quite proud of that, that, the, that these yeah. young doctors at that time who were listening to you are now filling important positions in China and doing important work. Yes, I'm very, uh, uh, very proud and uh, very satisfied. And then I came to China at regular time intervals and what has been very impressive has been the progress. Progress in science, progress in medicine. You see, a lot of things still have to be done. Um, there are a number of uh, actions to be taken by the government, act many things to be improved. Mm -hmm. But overall, when you look, uh, I, I look at a figure of the investment in research of the Chinese government over the past 15 years, well, it is very impressive. Now, the key point is how do you translate these efforts in prevention and treatment? How do you use the knowledge which is being generated? And I believe that uh, the spirit of many of the Chinese scientists is really to translate their finding, and this is something I appreciate very much. Uh, there is, as I'm sure you're aware, a, a very great respect in China for France and, and all things French, and the two mm -hmm. countries on the whole have a, have mm -hmm. a good relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that this helps in terms of Chinese uh, views of the Institut Pasteur, that it is a French organization? Yes, yes, and you see, I share with you the fact that uh, China and France have a special relationship and, and a very good one overall. But you see, for me, as I said, Pasteur is not a French institute with international collaborations. This is an international institute which is based in France, which makes a lot of difference mm. in the way we handle our scientists. I want them to move from one of the institutes to the other. I don't want them to stay in Paris. So, but yes, overall, uh, this, uh, this contributes to the very nice development of Pasteur in China. The, uh the motto of the Institut Pasteur is for research, for health, for our future. What part will China play in the future of your institute? That's a very good question. We have to design exactly. I believe that uh, China will contribute to uh, a, a significant part, I would say, of the research achievement. In other words, I believe that the institute we have, they will create knowledge they will generate, and they are already doing so, very high-level publications. So I believe that when I will consider in the future the 32 institutes, they will be at the forefront. This I'm really confident. But what we also want is to have them, and this is what we are, all of us, doing. I want them to convey this knowledge, these research activities to public health. I really believe that they will find new treatments, that they will find new vaccines, that they will contribute to some of the, uh, of controlling some of the epidemics, maybe even for viruses which are not present in China yet, but which might come in the future. They have the capacity to provide skills and expertise. Well, on that optimistic note, we'll leave it there. Dr. Christian Brechot, thanks very much indeed for coming. Thank on. you.